Great. Okay. Um, yeah, I just wanted to thank you guys for pulling this together. This is uh, extremely well organized. Uh, I know virtual conferences have definitely some difficulties, but this uh, interspace is super cool. Really uh, excited to play around with it. So uh, great job, guys, and uh, excited to tune in for some more presentations. Um, awesome. So I am here to talk today about an economic vaccine for COVID-19. Uh, and in particular, some of the initiatives that the Red Cross has been launching in Kenya and how we've seen that local currencies are enabling economic resilience in local communities. So obviously there has been some uh, crazy disruptions in the world lately and the, um, you know, the, the human toll of this virus is, you know, tragic and, and massive. And they definitely impact us all, especially the most vulnerable, um, you know, developing countries and uh, people who can't afford the um, necessities to protect themselves from the ravages of this virus. But the long-term effects of the virus actually run much deeper uh, and the, the economic fallout of this situation could be uh, last far longer than, than the actual biological impact. I mean, we kind of, laugh at this, um, you know, that, that real world disasters and we're worried about the economy. Um, you know, this isn't what dinosaurs did when, when meteors struck the earth. But uh, when we frame it in a different analogy, we see why the economy is so important. So the global economy is kind of like a circulatory system for the meta organism of humanity. Uh, we have goods and services flowing uh, to keep us alive and fed and warm and so on. And currency flow is kind of opposite to that in, in uh, transactions. And the disruptions we're going to see from COVID-19 will be like a series of economic heart attacks in this circulatory system that we have. Um, so when we have credit crunches or liquidity crises, this disrupts the flow of currency, uh, both between uh, you know, governments and banks or among banks or even between neighbors and local businesses. And the economic fallout has only just begun uh, with this crisis. So we saw a couple of weeks ago, the markets got really spooked and stocks tanked. Um, but this is, again, only the beginning. The economic effects of this are, are kind of like a, a, a domino or a house of cards. You know, Without work, uh, people don't have money. They stop shopping. They can't pay their rent or mortgages. And without people shopping and spending, then businesses go bankrupt and have to lay off more people. And the downward spiral continues and currency circulation slows. And ultimately, this, this impacts the globe in, uh, in ways that we've seen in the past, um, but they definitely last far longer usually than the, the actual physical crisis itself. But the funny thing about these situations is, you know, people still need to eat. They still need to live. They still need to stay warm. So there's still supply and there's still demand, but there's actually just no currency flow. So this is the problem that we that we need to resolve in the coming months. And it turns out this is not just limited to uh, COVID crises. This happens all the time in um, third world countries, like in rural Kenya, where there are farmers who need workers and workers who need to work, but there's often no cash in the local communities to make that transaction occur. So what they've seen is that local currencies, when introduced into these communities, can help immensely with this liquidity problem. So Grassroots Economics and the Danish Red Cross have been working on a project called Community Inclusion Currencies uh, for the past uh, about 10 years. And it's in, been in different forms. Initially, it was in uh, physical cash, like you can see in the picture here. Um, although now they're switching to cryptocurrencies, uh, and in particular, using bonding curves um, on, on feature phones, if you can believe it or not. So this is a really bleeding edge um, initiative going on on the ground in rural Kenya for the past few years. So it's extremely exciting. Uh, and the so far, the results have been very positive. So let's take a quick look at, at how it worked. So the Red Cross takes international donor funds and invests them into a local community by minting a local currency and then donating it to the community. So this enables uh, you know, that local farmer to hire local help 
Um, this creates currency flow in the local community, which gives both the farmer access to labor and the worker access to currency with which they can pay for education or um, groceries or local needs in, in whatever form uh, they, they have a need for. This localized spending keeps more value within the community. Um, we see in rural Kenya that often um, with the imports and exports from major city centers, um, a lot of the donated cash that the Red Cross used to bring in when they, when they donated Kenyan shillings, those shillings would be siphoned back to the major city centers along with the import-export market. Uh, so when we introduce a local currency, that actually keeps the currency within the community. And we see the, the, a single dollar within that community bounce around you know, 10 or 20 times before it might uh, be siphoned off to um, uh, Mombasa or any of the larger city centers. The great thing about these community currencies as well, especially when we're using bonding curves, is they have guaranteed res reserve and liquidity. So this actually solves some of the key problems with local currencies uh, that have been initiated up until now. And essentially what we're verging on is the ability for governments or foundations or, you know, the Red Cross could support struggling communities directly by buying the local currency and treating it as an impact investment. And I'm really excited that this could help move beyond corporate bailouts to community leveraging. We can actually directly invest in local currencies and support these communities in providing for themselves. So it's a much more uh, grassroots way to provide that support. A few quick stats on the Community Inclusion Currency Initiative. In my opinion, this is the most exciting crypto project that almost no one knows about, and there's very few people talking about it. Um, this project has unbanked Kenyans using bonding curves um, the Bancor bonding curve at this point, um, and they're using them on dumb phones. So if you've heard of the M-Pesa, um, uh, I, I wouldn't call it a project, currency, essentially, there are Kenyans basically trading um, phone phone minutes uh, as, a, as a digital currency. So this is uh, an experiment that's been going on in, in Kenya for a number of years. And so I think Kenyans have kind of this have leapfrogged the use of digital currencies over much of the world, especially on on feature phones, you know, on like texting T9 phones. Uh, they can, with a small menu, they can send um, digital currencies back and forth to each other. There are over 12,000 rural villagers paying for their basic needs, in part at least, with these community inclusion currencies. They've found that from early data, at least conservatively, they, these currencies are 20 times more effective than traditional cash aid. So what that means is essentially every dollar that the Red Cross donates to these communities uh, turns into effectively $20 of local currency spending. Um, so that basically 20Xs the impact of every Red Cross dollar that is contributed to these communities. Um, just in the past few months, um, Grassroots Economics and the Red Cross have open sourced uh, their designs, and they have now 40 plus new currency deployments in 50 regions all around rural and urban Kenya. And in total, there have been over 100,000 transactions within these currency networks supporting local trade, uh, which is extremely exciting. And from early analysis of this initiative, it has been hugely successful in bringing about local economic resilience. So we really are excited about this project um, and its potential to scale uh, to other countries or other communities who are interested in leveraging local economic resilience in this uh, global crisis. So there's a number of organizations involved with the Community Inclusion Project. Community Inclusion Currency, sorry. Um, grassroots Economics has been driving this forward uh, for about a decade or more uh, on the ground. They've been supported by the Danish Red Cross and the International Red Cross. Um, they're now working closely with Block Science to simulate and model these systems to ensure that we are um, you know, designing robust and resilient economies. Um, and also the, the common stack comes into this project, which I'll discuss a little bit more in the next slide. 
Um, but first, I'd like to discuss a little bit what, what is the common stack. Um, so essentially, we are an open source toolkit for the commons. We have a roadmap of four components for our minimum viable commons, including sustainable funding through a bonding curve um, and a few other components that give other um, DAO functionality or community functionality. And essentially, we, we see currency systems as public goods. So if we are designing currency systems that are going to benefit our communities, uh, we need to have token engineering to ensure we're doing it in an ethical um, and, uh, and fair way for the people within those communities. So the next build of the community inclusion currency project will include some of the common stack tools, such as the augmented bonding curve. Uh, and this is the economic tool that brings liquidity and interoperability between different local currencies. If you have any um, interest in local currencies, there these experiments have been going on for several decades and actually with a lot of success in, in many different places and in many different ways. There are um, LETs and Roscoe's and um, VLSAs. There are all sorts of different kinds of community currencies um, and they're all very effective in a local setting. What has been missing um, from a lot of these currency initiatives is interoperability with other currency initiatives. So a local currency is very good within that locality, but as soon as you leave that locality, uh, that currency is essentially worthless. It's not recognized by um, other uh, jurisdictions, and it has no way of transferring value from one currency into another. So this is where the augmented bonding curve, bonding curves in general, really provide that um, economic layer of interoperability and liquidity between different currencies. And this is, I think, going to, to scale the ability of, uh, of these networks to really create global systems change. Um, as we discussed, you know, designing resilient economies needs token engineering to mitigate the economic crises like we currency, currently see playing out. And the importance of modeling and simulating these tools is, is so critical because when we're launching community currencies as public infrastructure worldwide, we need to make sure that they are robust and stable. Um, you know, and this kind of verges on engineering ethics. When we design any public infrastructure, whether it's bridges or cell phones or um, you know, skyscrapers, we need to make sure that there is um, a responsibility to the people that will use them, that they're safe. And that's what the common stack is all about. So we are getting into an age of ethical economic design. Uh, and we believe that ec economies should be designed like um, cyber physical systems, like national power grids or internet technologies using established engineering practices. So we should be establishing cascade failure protections, fault sensitivity analyses, understanding the bounds of normal operations of our systems, um, and then limiting the action set of, of people within these systems so that um, they, they don't uh, cascade and run away into compounding failures like we're currently seeing uh, in the economy today. Uh, and of course, this all falls back to holistic sim uh, system simulation to make sure that when we are composing multiple mechanisms, um, and I think we will have the opportunity to explore more complex uh, systems in the future, uh, that the, all of these mechanisms work together. Because when we're working in complex adaptive systems like economies with humans who have you know, different unpredictable messy behavior, we need to be sure that uh, our systems won't break when we put some, some strain on them. Um, another interesting feature of bonding curves is they can actually act as a parachute um, in market free falls like we saw a couple of weeks ago, uh, both in crypto and in the real world, um, when there are an overwhelming number of buyers compared to sellers, you have the markets, uh, the bottoms kind of drop out of markets and you have these free falls which cause hysteria. Um, which caused more people to go and, uh, and try to sell. And, you know, all of, this, um, all of this can be mitigated by a bonding curve because a bonding curve basically provides a, uh, an automated buyer for every sell. 
So there's no opportunity for the market to just drop out underneath um, a massive buy, a massive sell pressure. And this can act as a kind of a, yeah, a parachute that slows down that market freefall and potentially mitigates the hysteria that comes along with these kind of black swan events. So when we're thinking about centralized national currencies um, and banking system in general, um, we feel that they're going from too big to fail to so big they fail. Um, when we're looking at centralized currencies, you know, like we discussed earlier with the economic uh, heart attacks that are coming our way, if we have distributed local currencies, we actually have much more resilient overlapping value networks that resemble uh, mycelium or you know, any of the fractal patterns we find in nature. Actually, this is a, a common design pattern in nature if you look up uh, visualizations of dark matter uh, or you know anything with these fractal patterns this is how nature uh, designs for resilience and this is what we can now get into uh, with distributed local currencies and this offers us an opportunity to move from monoculture to permaculture economics um, we know the dangers of monoculture uh, in farming if your country only grows apple trees well, if the temperature rises by two degrees or some pest gets loose, loose in your country that, that destroys apple trees, well, your whole crop for your whole country is lost. And we, we recognize that's ridiculous in farming, and yet we do it all the time in our currency systems. So having diverse local currencies allows us to move uh, more towards resilient patterns that we find in permaculture and in nature. Uh, and this, these complementary currencies can offer us diversity and resilience moving forward, which we find is incredibly important. So we are wondering about a global community inclusion currency rollout. Um, this is a, a very high leverage economic intervention to COVID-19. Um, and at the same time, it fosters you know, community self-determination and empowerment. This isn't... Um, um, aid coming in from the outside that is trying to determine how it should be used. This is basically giving empowerment to the community to govern for themselves how they want to evolve their uh, economic resilience. Local currencies can diversify our, mon our monetary systems, which brings greater resilience and actually allows us to represent a variety of different values rather than boiling everything down to the bottom dollar. So we have Red Cross feasibility studies being carried out in uh, seven plus countries at the moment. And actually we've gotten a lot of interest from even unrelated communities uh, to, the, to the community inclusion currency project who are interested in launching local currencies um, in their neighborhoods because they're already feeling um, the crisis, the, the crunch of neighbors wanting to interact but not having the, uh, the financial means to do so. So if you believe, like we do, that this is one of the most important um, economic interventions that we can make in this time of global crisis, we invite you to become a member of the Common Stack Trusted Seed, which is a community of uh, altruists and experts in uh, token engineering and uh, economic systems, governance systems. Um, and we essentially are trying to build the tools that will allow this infrastructure to spread uh, and address these concerns on a global level. You can check that out on our website at commonstack.org slash apply. We also have a series of Gitcoin grants going right now, uh, which are quadratically matched. So even one die or 10 die makes a huge difference in the amount of funds that go towards a number of these projects that we are currently supporting uh, in addressing the uh, COVID-19 crisis, uh, and also the infrastructural tools that we're building to allow this to spread to uh, a global solution. And if you are interested in following our progress, we have a number of Telegram channels here, a number of Twitter channels as well, uh, and I'll share these slides afterwards. I believe I have some uh, further reading on this slide. And uh, yeah, if there's any other um, thoughts or questions. I think we have a few minutes left to answer any questions that may be out there.
and I think there's a chat. Maybe there are already some. There is no question so far, but we do have as much time as we want since this is the last talk of the day. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Uh, very interesting as well. Uh, until any other questions are coming in, I'm going to hand you a question that was asked to the last speaker as well, and that I think fits very well for you too. Uh, for a lot of these tools that you and others are building for communities, for local communities, it is important that a lot of different members of that community can use it. So can you maybe give your perspective on uh, how user interfaces should be built or how they should be engineered to allow for as much inclusion as possible in such a local community? Definitely. Um, so yeah, I, I guess I could probably give a bit more information about how this currently works in Kenya. Um, so because most of the users in these communities are working on feature phones, which are like uh, push button phones, um, they actually use the USSD um, uh, interface. So it kind of comes up with a little numbered menu so one, make a transaction, two, check your balance, for example. Um, so they can hit, you know, star 611 or something like that. Um, the menu will come up and they can transfer um, on, a, on a feature phone. I think this is obviously very um, catered to this audience. Um, and it also comes in a centralized system. So grassroots economics does not expect, um, you know, rural Kenyans to uh, guard their private keys. They actually just have a, a PIN login, uh, which allows... Uh, the grassroots economics team to verify their identity um, and allow them to make transactions through the grassroots economics uh, network without the um, villager actually holding the private key. So I think the user interface, as far as what is currently um, implemented in Kenya, uh, is a little bit different than what we might see rolled out um, in, you know, on a on a mobile app. Um, but I definitely agree, UX and the front end is is incredibly important. Um, and I think there's a lot more um, work to be done there. Grassroots Economics has been working with a group called Accenture um, to put together basically a dashboard of all of the data uh, that comes in from these community inclusion currency pilots. Um, so I'll, I'll include that also in the read more section if anybody wants to take a look at basically the, um, the kind of visualization that goes along with these projects in the beginning. Um, and I think there's much more to come as this, um, you know, as this tool spreads as a useful uh, intervention in, in economic distress. Absolutely. Um, and I think it also fits with what we've heard so far quite well. I know we, we've had a comment today uh, on bonding curves and some of these other mechanisms on how people who are not too much into the math, let's say, uh, how they can understand these concepts and i know that chris for example showed your implementation of the of the simula uh, simulation preview for the bonding curves um, and i think stuff like that is really helpful to visualize and to uh, really ground what is happening behind the scenes for anybody who does not uh, want to go too deep into the theoretical concepts definitely yeah i, th I think we're we're kind of walking a, a fine line um you know, when you when you use the internet, most 99.9% .9 of people don't know how the internet works. You know, when we use a car, 99.9% .9 of people don't know how a combustion engine works. We can put that kind of stuff under the hood, uh, and you can just use the, the the tool for what it's useful for. Um, and I feel like bonding curves are still such a new economic tool that we have a large community that's very interested in them. And of course, like skepticism is 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 important when we're talking about like all of the amazing functionality of this new tool. It's important to understand, you know, its limitations and what it can and can't do. Um, but in terms of, you know, users, we, we don't think use end users will be interacting with the bonding curve and they won't need to know even what a bonding curve is. It will just provide useful functionality uh, within that app and, and the, you know, how it works can stay with the token engineers just like you know, it's the mechanical engineers who know how a combustion engine works. The user doesn't have to worry about it. So I think we're still very early in this new economic exploration um, and people want to know how this works, but ultimately we can abstract away a lot of that complication uh, when we're embedding these tools in, in an app that users can, can make use of. Absolutely. 
for anyone who is interested in uh, grassroots economics, we will have Will as a speaker tomorrow. We'll run at 5.20 CEST. So I'm sure he will give some more insights into that. Uh, are there any other questions in the chat or in the room right now? I, s I see a few in the chat, actually. Um, Angela asked, how does education on the local currency in Kenya actually look online or on site? Um, so this is a great question, and I didn't touch on that too much in the presentation, but um, essentially there are uh, women's savings groups in Kenya called chamas, and these chamas are sort of like community commons already. So they, Will Ruddick and Grassroots Economics works very closely with these women's savings groups. Um, and they're not, you know, trying to impose a tool on them, but they're, you know, hearing their needs, understanding um, what what kind of tools can aid them in their uh, savings and, and uh, development of community economic resilience. Uh, and the community inclusion currencies are basically uh, launched in these environments where the education around their use um, and around you know the community rules for how they're implemented, how uh, how they're governed, uh, goes through basically already existing social processes through the these chamas. So a lot of it would be on site. They have um, they have regular meetings, um, and then I think it's a very much a um, education by um, word of mouth as well. 